You actually showed something very interesting about uh, the effects of, of uh, sulforaphane on a certain type of uh, mi microbe species, um, H. pylori. Yeah, so, so H. pylori is a, uh, known, in, its full name is Helicobacter pylori. Um, uh, Helicobacter pylori is a very interesting organism um, in that it grows primarily or exclusively in the stomach. And it occupies that niche in a very unique fashion. It, it apparently has an enzyme that is called urease, but an enzyme that allows it to neutralize the pH in a, in a little microenvironment around the bacterial cells in the, in the stomach. I shouldn't use the term gut yeah. because we also use the term gut to refer to the intestines. Um, so the stomach is very acid, extremely acid. That's part of the way it does its job. Um, and Helicobacter tunnels into the mucus layer inside the stomach and creates, with enzymes, creates this little zone of, of neutral pH, which allows it to thrive. Otherwise, it would be, it would be killed as are any other, or almost any other bacteria that enter the enter the stomach. Um, and it's a very interesting critter, if I can use the term. Can I call it a critter? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very interesting critter because um, some people, some very well respected and well-known microbiologists, for example, uh, Martin Blazer at NYU, um, maintains, and I happen to, I happen to drink this Kool-Aid, I happen to believe this, that Helicobacter's been around all during our evolution, of the evolution of humankind, um, certainly for tens of thousands of years, people have had Helicobacter in their systems. And something like 55% of the world's population at the moment has Helicobacter in their systems. In some areas, um, recently in Japan and, and certainly some areas um, in, in Africa and Asia, almost all people have Helicobacter um, and some areas of South America. And it's a colonizer. It's a, it's a commensal symbiotic organism, it would appear. Um, it may actually confer benefit on its host, in other words, you, the person. Um, if levels of Helicobacter get too high, um, if the number of bacterial cells per square millimeter, per square inch, or per square mile, or however you want to you wanna quantify them, gets too great, then they start to have clearly pathological effects. They can cause ulcers, they do cause ulcers, and they can eventually, that can eventually lead to stomach cancer. I believe the, the last estimate I saw was that the World Health Organization um, considers uh, Helicobacter to confer a four, I think a three or four to six fold increased risk of stomach cancer if you're colonized. Um, but the question is, if you are colonized with Helicobacter, can you reduce the levels of colonization, keep it down to a low roar, as it were? In other words, let a few of them hang around in your stomach as long as they don't um, overrun the system. Um, and so the, 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 the um, prescription for someone who has Helicobacter in this country, and I believe in, in Europe, I'm not a gastroenterologist, but is to wipe it out. So to treat it with so-called triple therapy, three separate antibiotics, um, and kill it so you can't find it anymore. Um, an alternative, and I should say, about 15% of people who are given that treatment um, either can't take it or it doesn't work. Um, so an alternative that many people find appealing is, is a dietary um, approach to controlling Helicobacter. In other words, if, uh, and we don't have answers to these questions, but if so many people around the world are colonized and it's been with us for so long and humankind is still humankind, um, are there perhaps benefits to having it? So, for example, um, it's been shown, I believe this was Martin Blazer who showed this uh, a number of years ago, that um, uh, there's an inverse correlation between helicobacter infection and childhood asthma. So, you know, it may protect due to stimulation of the immune system, other mechanisms. It may protect against certain diseases, um, but we just don't know enough. So 
may be reducing the levels of helicobacter in the stomach um, again, keeping it to a low roar where it can't cause inflammation or where it doesn't cause major inflammation, doesn't give you ulcers, um, may be enough to reduce the risk of its causing stomach cancer at some point in the future. If it doesn't cause inflammation and there are only a few cells here and there that are sort of hanging on, maybe that's okay. So that can be done by a dietary approach. And with that in mind, um, uh, we actually looked at the ability of sulforaphane to kill helicobacter. Um, of course, if it had wiped out all the helicobacter in people who were infected, I, I would have been happy with that also. That would have certainly been an interesting finding. Um, what we ultimately found, and this was done with collaborators in Japan in a 50-person in a trial, um, we found that helicobacter can reduce the levels, sorry, that sulforaphane or broccoli sprouts, actually, fresh broccoli sprouts, were able to reduce levels of colonization in infected people or colonized people, um, and were able to reduce markers of inflammation in those same people. That work grew from an observation that I made uh, with, a, with a different colleague, a French colleague, um, who was visiting the U.S. on sabbatical, Alain Lesniewski. So he and I discovered and published in uh, about 2002 that in vitro, in a test tube, sulforaphane was very capable of killing helicobacter. Not only did it kill um, uh, natural strains, but it killed strains that, were, that he had recultured from some of his patients. He's a gastroenterologist. Um, and it killed singly and doubly antibiotic resistant strains. So as you know, antibiotic resistance uh, in bacteria of all sorts in all settings is a huge problem, and helicobacter is no different. Um, once helicobacter in people start seeing a bunch of antibiotics, some of, some of them develop resistance, including resistance to two of the, of the commonly used um, antibiotics that are used to treat it. So the fact that sulforaphane was equally effective in killing them was, we thought, quite significant. Um, and interestingly, sulforaphane is not as potently antibiotic against a whole variety of other bacteria. Um, so do you know why the H. pylori is so sensitive to it? Um, you know, we don't. Um, we thought we had some clues. We think we thought we had some clues, and actually, Al, uh, Dr. Lozniewski's uh, colleague in France um, uh, had done some work on that, which was never published. He, this colleague, for reasons that we need not get into here, is no longer in the business of science, um, and so that the paper never got published, and we never really finished the, the finished the proof. So we're not sure why it's so potently antibiotic. Um, one thing that I can tell you is that in, in the quest for that answer, um, quite recently, um, Kitty Stevenson, who works, works here with us, and I um, started looking at the ability of sulforaphane to inhibit urease, which is that enzyme that I told you that creates, um, uh, that neutralizes the pH in the mucus of the stomach. Um, and we found that, indeed, sulforaphane is quite an effective inhibitor mm. of that enzyme. But, so again, we thought we had a real eureka moment, but it turned out that wiping out that enzyme um, wasn't sufficient to kill helicobacter um, because strains, um, uh, how do I put this, strains of helicobacter that had been engineered by others to, be, to not contain urease uh, were still killed by sulforaphane. So it wasn't, so the urease, um, so inhibiting urease might be important from a disease prevention uh, standpoint, but it's not how the molecule killed the bacteria. Okay. Sorry to present such a complicated yeah. <laughs> story, but that's the way things that's roll science. in this business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. But the, um, the also very not surprising to me uh, results of it lowering inflammation is one of my uh, obsessions with sulforaphane, generally speaking, I'm, uh, I'm very interested in anything in, in my diet and my lifestyle that I can do that will uh, lower the amount of systemic inflammation that I have in my body. And, and sulforaphane, it's been shown in, uh, you've shown this and others have shown that, you know, even 
broccoli sprout extract powder given to people can lower C-reactive protein levels by as much as 20%. Other inflammatory cytokines, IL-6, can be lowered by something similar. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's having a robust and measurable effect in people, um, you know, that's been repeatable in, in several different studies that I've seen. But one of the reasons I'm so interested in this is because, well, inflammation really, you know, plays a role in a lot of diseases like cancer, but it really seems to be a driver of the aging process. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've, uh, I think I mentioned to this to you briefly, but I actually think that sulforaphane may be a anti-aging compound. Uh, it's one of the reasons I'm obsessed with sprouting and taking it. Um, I think it actually not only is it uh, preventing these diseases like cancer, but also maybe actually delaying the aging process by, by activating NRF2, which then activates all these anti-inflammatory genes, activates antioxidant genes, including all the glutathione-related enzymes. I don't know if you've seen this study, but um, I think I also mentioned to you that I would love to see some lifespan studies done um, in animals. I know those are not easy to do. They take a long time, but... Um, there was a study ha that was done in this red flower beetle. Have you seen this study? No. Okay, no. so let me tell you. Okay. So there's a red flower beetle. Um, yes, it's it's a bug, but they have an NR they have an NRF2 gene that's yeah. you know homologous to humans. Um, also, the Foxo gene as well. Mm -hmm. So they the scientists fed these um, red flower beetles uh, different doses of uh, broccoli sprout extract. And the doses were ranged from, I don't, it was hot, low to high, I can't yeah. re recall, yeah. but it was a dose response. Uh -huh. And what they found is that um, at the, I think it was at the highest dose, mm -hmm. these, it extended the lifespan of these beetles by 15%. Mm -hmm. And on, when, they put, uh, when they expose these beetles to um, high oxidative stress all the time by keeping them in a warmer environment constantly, mm -hmm. it extended their lifespan by 30%. And it was totally dependent on NRF2. So if they knocked down NRF2, the lifespan extension went away. So I was like, wow. this is a great teaser, yeah. right? Yeah. Because if it's happening, and I mean, obviously it's a bug, but it's the same gene. They have a homologous gene, you know? And yeah. if it's extending this lifespan of this critter that has the same similar gene that we have, then I, I feel like there's potential there. That's that's. Fascinating. No, I wasn't for me. So I'll send you the paper. Please, I have to ask you: Does this a red beetle that likes flowers, or a beetle <laughs> that likes red, red flower. flowers? It okay. eats red okay. flower. Okay. <laughs>